Chapter 9, Part 2 of Fifty Years in Chains, or The Life of an American Slave. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White. Fifty Years in Chains, or The Life of an American Slave, by Charles Ball. Chapter 9, Part 2. It was now determined by the gentleman that, as the lady was still alive, we ought not to lose a moment in endeavoring to rescue her from her dreadful situation. I pointed out the large pine trees in the direction of which I heard the cries of the young lady, and near which I believe she was, undertaking at the same time to act as pilot in penetrating the thicket. Three of the gentlemen and myself accordingly set out, leaving the other two with the wounded mulatto with directions to inform us when we deviated from a right line to the pine trees. This they were able to do by attending to the noise we made with nearly as much accuracy as if they had seen us. The atmosphere had now become a little cloudy, and the morning was very dark, even in the oak woods. But when we had entered the thickets of the swamp, all objects became utterly invisible and the obscurity was as total as if our eyes had been closed. Our companions on the dry ground lost sight of the pine trees and could not give us any directions in our journey. We became entangled in briars and vines and mats of bushes from which the greatest exertions were necessary to disengage ourselves. It was so dark that we could not see the fallen trees, and missing these fell into quagmires and sloughs of mud and water into which we sunk up to the armpits and from which we were able to extricate ourselves only by seizing upon the hanging branches of the surrounding trees. After struggling in this half-drowned condition for at least a quarter of an hour, we reached a small dry spot where the gentlemen again held a council as to ulterior measures. They called to those left on the shore to know if we were proceeding toward the pine trees, but received for answer that the pines were invisible, and they knew not whether we were right or wrong. In this state of uncertainty, it was thought most prudent to wait the coming day in our present resting place. The air was frosty, and in our wet clothes, loaded as we were with mud, it may be imagined that our feelings were not pleasant, and when the day broke, it brought us but little relief, for we found, as soon as it was light enough to enable us to see around, that we were on one of those insulated dry spots called tussocks by the people of the South. These tussocks are formed by clusters of small trees which, taking root in the mud, are in process of time surrounded by long grass, which, entwining its roots with those of the trees, overspread and cover the surface of the muddy foundation by which the superstructure is supported. These tussocks are often several yards in diameter. That upon which we now were stood in the midst of a great miry pool, into which we were again obliged to launch ourselves and struggle onward for a distance of ten yards before we reached the line of some fallen and decaying trees. It was now broad daylight, and we saw the pine trees at the distance of about a hundred yards from us. But even with the assistance of the light, we had great difficulty in reaching them, to do which we were compelled to travel at least a quarter of a mile by the angles and curves of the fallen timber upon which alone we could walk this part of the swamp being a vast, half-fluid bog. It was sunrise when we reached the pines, which we found standing upon a small islet of firm ground, containing, as well as I could judge, about half an acre covered with a heavy growth of white maples, swamp oaks, a few large pines, and a vast mat of swamp laurel, called in the south, ivy. I had no doubt that the object of our search was somewhere on this little island, but small as it was, it was no trifling affair to give every part of it a minute examination, for the stems and branches of the ivy were so minutely interwoven with each other, and spread along the ground in so many curves and crossings, that it was impossible to proceed a single rod without lying down and creeping along the earth. The gentleman agreed that if any one discovered the young lady, he should immediately call to the others, and we all entered the thicket. I, however, turned along the edge of the island with the intention of making its circuit for the purpose of tracing, if possible, the footsteps of those who had passed between it and the main shore. I made my way more than half round the island 
without much difficulty and without discovering any signs of persons having been here before me. But in crossing the trunk of a large tree which had fallen, and the top of which extended far into the ivy, I perceived some stains of mud on the bark of the log. Looking into the swamp, I saw that the root of this tree was connected with other fallen timber, extending beyond the reach of my vision, which was obstructed by the bramble of the swamp and the numerous evergreens growing here. I now advanced along the trunk of the tree until I reached its topmost branches, and here discovered evident signs of a small trail leading into the thicket of ivy. Creeping along and following this trail by the small bearberry bushes that had been trampled down and had not again risen to an erect position, I was led almost across the island, and found that the small bushes were discomposed quite up to the edge of a vast heap of the branches of evergreen trees produced by the falling of several large juniper cypress trees, which grew in the swamp in a cluster, and having been blown down had fallen with their tops athwart each other, and upon the almost impervious mat of ivies with which the surface of the island was coated over. I stood and looked at the mass of entangled green bush, but could not perceive the slightest marks of any entrance into its labyrinths. Nor did it seem possible for any creature larger than a squirrel to penetrate it. It now for the first time struck me as a great oversight in the gentlemen that they had not compelled the mulatto David to describe the place where they had concealed the lady and as the forest was so dense that no communication could be had with the shore, either by word or signs, we could not now procure any information on this subject. I therefore called to the gentlemen who were on the island with me, and desired them to come to me without delay. Small as this island was, it was after the lapse of many minutes that the overseer and the other gentlemen arrived where I stood, and when they came, they would have been the subjects of mirthful emotions, had not the tragic circumstances in which I was placed banished from my heart every feeling but that of the most profound melancholy. When the gentlemen had assembled, I informed them of signs of footsteps that I had traced from the other side of the island, and told them that I believed the young lady lay somewhere under the heap of brushwood before us. This opinion obtained but little credit because there was no opening in the bush by which anyone could enter it but on going a few paces round the heap i perceived a small snaggy pole resting on the brush and nearly concealed by it with the lower end stuck in the ground the branches had been cut from this pole at the distance of three or four inches from the main stem which made it a tolerable substitute for a ladder i immediately ascended the pole which led me to the top of the pile and here i discovered an opening in the brush between the forked top of one of the cypress trees through which a man might easily pass. Applying my head to this aperture, I distinctly heard a quick and laborious breathing, like that of a person in extreme illness, and again called the gentleman to follow me. When they came up the ladder, the breathing was audible to all, and one of the gentlemen, whom I now perceived to be the stranger, who was with us in my master's cellar when I was bled, slid down into the dark and narrow passage, without uttering a word. I confess that some feelings of trepidation passed through my nerves when I stood alone, but now that a leader had preceded me, I followed and glided through the smooth and elastic cypress tops to the bottom of this vast labyrinth of green boughs. When I reached the ground, I found myself in contact with the gentleman who was in advance of me, and near one end of a large, concave, oblong, open space formed by the branches of the trees having been supported and kept above the ground, partly by a cluster of very large and strong ivies that grew here, and partly by a young gum tree which had been bent into the form of an arch by the falling timber. Though we could not see into this leafy cavern from above, yet when we had been in it a few moments, we had light enough to see the objects around us with tolerable clearness. But that which surprised us both greatly was that the place was totally silent, and we could not perceive the appearance of any living thing except ourselves. After we had been here some minutes, our vision became still more distinct, and I saw at the other end of the open space ashes of wood and some extinguished brands, but there was no smoke. Going to these ashes and stirring them with a stick, I found coals of fire carefully covered over in a hole six or eight inches deep. When he saw the fire, the gentleman spoke to me, 
and expressed his astonishment that we heard the breathing no longer. But he had scarcely uttered these words when a faint groan, as of a woman in great pain, was heard to issue apparently from the ground. But a motion of branches on our right assured me that the sufferer was concealed there. The gentleman sprung to the spot, pushed aside the pendant boughs, stooped low beneath the bent ivies, and came out bearing in his hands a delicate female figure. As he turned round and exposed her half-closed eye and white forehead to the light, he exclaimed, "'Eternal God, Maria, is it you?' He then pressed her to his bosom and sunk upon the ground, still holding her closely in his embrace. The lady lay motionless in his arms, and I thought she was dead. Her hair hung matted and disheveled from her head. A handkerchief, once white, but now soiled with dust and stained with blood, was bound firmly round her head, covering her mouth and chin, and was fastened at the back of the neck by a double knot and secured by a ligature of cypress bark. I knew not whom most to pity. The lady, who now lay insensible in the arms that still clasped her tenderly, or the unhappy gentleman who, having cut the cords from her limbs and the handkerchief from her face, now sat and silently gazed upon her death-like countenance. He uttered not a sigh, and moved not a joint, but his breast heaved with agony. The sinews and muscles of his neck rose and fell like those of a man in convulsions. All the lineaments of his face were, alternately, contracted and expanded as if his last moments were at hand whilst great drops of sweat rolled down his forehead as though he struggled against an enemy whose strength was more than human. Oppressed by the sight of so much wretchedness, I turned from its contemplation and called aloud to the gentleman without, who had all this time been waiting to hear from us, to come up the ladder to the top of the pile of boughs. The overseer was quickly at the top of the opening by which I had descended, and I now informed him that we had found the lady— he ordered me to hand her up, and I desired the gentleman who was with me to permit me to do so, but this he refused, and, mounting the boughs of the fallen trees and supporting himself by the strong branches of the ivies, he quickly reached the place where the overseer stood. He even here refused to part from his charge, but bore her down the ladder alone. He was, however, obliged to accept aid in conveying her through the swamp to the place where we had left the two gentlemen with the wounded mulatto, whose sufferings, demon as he was, were sufficient to move the hardest heart. His right arm and left leg were broken, and he had lost much blood before we returned from the island, and as he could not walk, it was necessary to carry him home. We had not brought any horses, and until the lady was recovered, no one seemed to think any more about the mulatto after he was shot down. It was proposed to send for a horse to take David home, but it was finally agreed that we should leave him in the woods where he was until a man could be sent for him with a cart. At the time we left him, his groans and lamentations seemed to excite no sympathy in the breast of any. More cruel sufferings yet awaited him. The lady was carried home in the arms of the gentleman, and she did not speak until after she was bathed and put to bed in my master's house, as I afterwards heard. I know she did not speak on the way. She died on the fourth day after her rescue, and before her death related the circumstances of her misfortune, as I was told by a colored woman who attended her in her illness in the following manner. As she was riding in the dusk of the evening at a rapid trot a few yards behind her brother, a black man sprang from behind a tree standing close by the side of the road, seized her by her riding dress, and dragged her to the ground, but failed to catch the bridle of the horse, which sprang off at full speed. Another negro immediately came to the aid of the first and said, I could not catch him. We must make haste. They carried her as fast as they could go to the place where we found her, when they bound her hands, feet, and mouth, and left her until the next night and had left her the second morning only a few minutes, when she heard the report of guns. Soon after this, by great efforts, she extricated one of her feet from the bark with which she was bound, but finding herself too weak to stand, she crawled, as far as she could, under the boughs of the trees, hoping that when her assassins returned again they would not be able to find her, and that she might there die alone. Exhausted by the efforts she had made to remove herself, she fell into the stupor of sleep 
from which she was aroused by the noise we made when we descended into the cavern. She then supposed us to be her destroyers returned again, lay still and breathed as softly as possible to prevent us from hearing her. But when she heard the voice of the gentleman who was with me, the tones of which were familiar to her, she groaned and moved her feet to let us know where she was. This exertion and the idea of her horrid condition overcame the strength of her nerves, and when her deliverer raised her from the ground, she had swooned and was unconscious of all things. We had no sooner arrived at the house than inquiry was made for Hardy, but it was ascertained in the kitchen that he had not been seen since the previous evening, at nightfall, when he had left the kitchen for the purpose of going to sleep at the stable with David, as he had told one of the black women and preparation was immediately made to go in pursuit of him. For this purpose, all the gentlemen present equipped themselves with pistols, fowling pieces, and horns, such as are used by fox hunters. Messengers were dispatched round the country to give notice to all the planters within the distance of many miles of the crime that had been committed, and of the escape of one of its perpetrators, with a request to them to come without delay and join in the pursuit intended to be given. Those who had dogs, trained to chase thieves, were desired to bring them. And a gentleman who lived twelve miles off and who owned a bloodhound was sent for and requested to come with his dog in all haste. In consequence, I suppose, of the information I had given, I was permitted to be present at these deliberations, and though my advice was not asked, I was often interrogated concerning my knowledge of the affair. Some proposed to go at once with dogs and horses into the woods, and traversed the swamp and thickets for the purpose of rousing Hardy from the place of concealment he might have chosen. But the opinion of the overseer prevailed, who thought that from the intimate knowledge possessed by him of all the swamps and coverts in the neighborhood, there would be little hope of discovering him in this manner. The overseer advised them to wait the coming of the gentleman with his bloodhound before they entered the woods, for the reason that if the bloodhound could not be made to take the trail, he would certainly find his game before he quit it, if not thrown off the scent by the men, horses, and dogs crossing his course. But if the bloodhound could not take the scent, they might then adopt the proposed plan of pursuit with as much success as at present. This counsel being adopted, the horses were ordered into the stable, and the gentlemen entered the house to take their breakfast and wait the arrival of the bloodhound. Nothing was said of the mulatto David, who seemed to be forgotten, not a word being spoken by any one of bringing him from the woods. I knew that he was suffering the most agonizing pains, and great as were his crimes, his groans and cries of anguish still seemed to echo in my ears. But I was afraid to make any application in his behalf, lest, even yet, I might be suspected of some participation in his offenses. For I knew that the most horrid punishments were often inflicted upon slaves merely on suspicion. As the morning advanced, the number of men and horses in front of my master's mansion increased, and before ten o'clock I think there were, at least, fifty of each, the horses standing hitched, and the men conversing in groups without, or assembled together within the house. At length the owner of the bloodhound came, bringing with him his dog in a chaise, drawn by one horse. The harness was removed from the horse, its place supplied by a saddle and bridle, and the whole party set off for the woods. As they rode away, my master, who was one of the company, told me to follow them, but we had proceeded only a little distance when the gentleman stopped, and my master, after speaking with the owner of the dog, told the overseer to go back to the house and get some piece of the clothes of Hardy that had been worn by him lately. The overseer returned, and we all proceeded forward to the place where David lay. We found him where we had left him, greatly weakened by the loss of blood, and complaining that the cold air caused his wounds to smart intolerably. When I came near him, he looked at me and told me I had betrayed him. None of the gentlemen seemed at all moved by his sufferings, and when any of them spoke to him, it was with derision and every epithet of scorn and contumely. As it was apparent that he could not escape, no one proposed to remove him to a place of greater safety but several of the horsemen, as they passed, lashed him with the thongs of their whips. But I do not believe he felt these blows, the pain he endured from his wounds being so great as to drown the sensation of such minor afflictions. The day had already become warm, although the night had been cold, 
The sun shone with great clearness, and many carrion crows, attracted by the scent of blood, were perched upon the trees near where we now were. When the overseer came up with us, he brought an old blanket in which Hardy had slept for some time, and handed it to the owner of the dog, who, having first caused the hound to smell of the blanket, untied the cord in which he had been led, and turned him into the woods. The dog went from us fifty or sixty yards in a right line, then made a circle around us, again commenced his circular movement, and pursued it nearly half round. Then he dropped his nose to the ground, snuffed the tainted surface, and moved off through the woods slowly, almost touching the earth with his nose. The owner of the dog and twelve or fifteen others followed him, whilst the residue of the party dispersed themselves along the edge of the swamp, and the overseer ordered me to stay and watch the horses of those who dismounted, going himself on foot in the pursuit. When the gentlemen were all gone out of sight, I went to David, who lay all this time within my view, for the purpose of asking him if I could render him any assistance. He begged me to bring him some water, as he was dying of thirst, no less than with the pain of his wounds. One of the horsemen had left a large tin horn hanging on his saddle. This I took, and, stopping the small end closely with leaves, filled it with water from the swamp, and gave it to the wounded man who drank it, and then, turning his head towards me, said, "'Hardy and I had a plan to have this thing brought up upon you, and to have you hung for it, but you have escaped.' He then asked me if they intended to leave him to die in the woods, or take him home and hang him. I told him I had heard them talk of taking him home in a cart, but what was to be done with him I did not know. I felt a horror of the crimes committed by this man, was pained by the sight of his sufferings, and, being unable to relieve the one or to forgive the other, went to a place where I could neither see nor hear him, and sat down to await the return of those who had gone in the pursuit of Hardy. In the circumstances which surrounded me, it cannot be supposed that my feelings were pleasant, or that time moved very fleetly, but painful as my situation was, I was obliged to bear it for many hours. From the time the gentlemen left me, I neither saw nor heard them until late in the afternoon, when five or six of them returned, having lost their companions in the woods. Towards sundown I heard a great noise of horns blow, and of men shouting at a distance in the forest, and soon after my master, the owner of the bloodhound, and many others, returned, bringing with them Hardy, whom the hound had followed ten or twelve miles through the swamps and thickets, had at last caught him, and would soon have killed him, had he not been compelled to relinquish his prey. When the party had all returned, a kind of court was held in the woods, where we then were, for the purpose of determining what punishment should be inflicted upon Hardy and David. All agreed at once that an example of the most terrific character ought to be made of such atrocious villains, and that it would defeat the ends of justice to deliver these fellows up to the civil authority to be hanged like common murderers. The next measure was to settle upon the kind of punishment to be inflicted upon them, and the manner of executing the sentence. Hardy was all this time sitting on the ground covered with blood and yet bleeding profusely in hearing his inexorable judges. The dog had mangled both his arms and hands in a shocking manner, torn a large piece of flesh entirely away from one side of his breast, and sunk his fangs deep in the side of his neck. No other human creature that I have ever seen presented a more deplorable spectacle of mingled crime and cruelty. It was now growing late, and the fate of these miserable men was to be decided before the company separated to go to their several homes. One proposed to burn them, another to flay them alive, and a third to starve them to death and many other modes of slowly and tormentingly extinguishing life were named. But that which was finally adopted was, of all others, the most horrible. The wretches were unanimously sentenced to be stripped naked and bound down securely upon their backs, on the naked earth, in sight of each other, to have their mouths closely covered with bandages, to prevent them from making a noise to frighten away the birds, and in this manner to be left to be devoured alive by the carrion crows and buzzards which swarm in every part of South Carolina. The sentence was instantly carried into effect so far as its execution depended on us. Hardy and his companion were divested of their clothes, stretched upon their backs on the ground, 
their mouths bandaged with handkerchiefs, their limbs extended, and these, together with their necks being crossed by numerous poles, were kept close to the earth by forked sticks driven into the ground, so as to prevent the possibility of moving any part of their persons. And in this manner these wicked men were left to be torn in pieces by birds of prey. The buzzards and carrion crows always attack dead bodies by pulling out and consuming the eyes first. They then tear open the bowels and feed upon the intestines. We returned to my master's plantation, and I did not see this place again until the next Sunday, when several of my fellow slaves went with me to see the remains of the dead, but we found only their bones. Great flocks of buzzards and carrion crows were assembled in the trees, giving a dismal aspect to the woods, and I hastened to abandon a place fraught with so many afflicting recollections. The lady who had been the innocent sacrifice of the brutality of the men, whose bones I had seen bleaching in the sun, had died on Saturday evening, and her corpse was buried on Monday, in a graveyard on my master's plantation. I have never seen a large cotton plantation in Carolina without its burying ground. This burying ground is not only the place of sepulture of the family who are the proprietors of the estate, but also of many other persons who have lived in the neighborhood. Half an acre or an acre of ground is appropriated as a graveyard on one side of which the proprietors of the estate, from age to age, are buried, whilst the other parts of the ground are open to strangers, poor people of their vicinity, and, in general, to all who choose to inter their dead within its boundaries. This custom prevails as far north as Maryland, and it seems to me to be much more consonant to the feelings of solitude and tender recollections which we always associate with the memory of departed friends than the practice of promiscuous interment in a churchyard where all idea of seclusion is banished by the last home of the dead being thrown open to the rude intrusions of strangers, where the sanctity of the sepulchre is treated as a common, and where the grave itself is, in a few years, torn up or covered over to form a temporary resting place for some new tenant. The family of the deceased lady, though not very wealthy, was amongst the most ancient and respectable in this part of the country. And on Sunday, whilst the dead body lay in my master's house, there was a continual influx and efflux of visitors, in carriages, on horseback, and on foot. The house was open to all who chose to come, and the best wines, cakes, sweetmeats, and fruits were handed about to the company by the servants though I observed that none remained for dinner except the relations of the deceased, those of my master's family, and the young gentleman who was with me on the island. The visitors remained but a short time when they came, and were nearly all in mourning. This was the first time that I had seen a large number of the fashionable people of Carolina assembled together, and their appearance impressed me with an opinion favorable to their character. I had never seen an equal number of people anywhere, whose deportment was more orderly and decorous, nor whose feelings seemed to be more in accordance with the solemnity of the event which had brought them together. I had been ordered by the overseer to remain at the great house until the afternoon for the purpose, as I afterwards learned, of being seen by those who came to see the corpse, and many of the ladies and gentlemen inquired for me, and when I was pointed out to them, commended my conduct and fidelity in discovering the authors of the murder condoled with me for having suffered innocently, and several gave me money. One old lady, who came in a pretty carriage, drawn by two black horses, gave me a dollar. On Monday the funeral took place, and several hundred persons followed the corpse to the grave, over which a minister delivered a short sermon. The young gentleman who was with me when we found the deceased on the island walked with her mother to the graveyard, and the little brother followed with a younger sister. After the interment, wines and refreshments were handed round to the whole assembly, and at least a hundred persons remained for dinner with my master's family. At four o'clock in the afternoon, the carriages and horses were ordered to the door of the courtyard of the house, and the company retired. At sundown, the plantation was as quiet as if its peace had never been disturbed. End of chapter 9, part 2. Recording by James K. White. Chula Vista.